happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys hey everyone welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason verlindy thank you so much for tuning in as always that's john rauhaus playing in the background i probably don't need to remind you uh, the holidays are quickly approaching a little too quick if you ask me uh, and the fretboard journal makes for one heck of a gift you have any friends or loved ones who are as into music as you are you can get them a gift subscription which will get them four issues of the fretboard journal delivered straight to their door our 45th issue is finally going to be mailing in about a week so everyone who subscribes now for themselves or for a loved one uh, they'll, they'll get their magazine and uh, if you do a gift subscription we include a little handwritten gift card with a personalized message from you on it so uh, they'll be opening that fretboard journal box and knowing exactly where this amazing magazine came from. You can go to fretboardjournal.com and click on the shop tab and see all of our offerings. We also have some amazing merch right now and some amazing videos and podcasts for you to check out beyond the one you are listening to. So where to begin with today's guest, Craig Korth. I have known Craig pretty much the entire time I've been doing the Fretboard Journal, which is now about 15 years He is one of my favorite people in this world, and he lives in one of my favorite places in this world, which is Nelson, British Columbia, a very cute little ski mountain town that's, I don't know, seven hours away from where I am sitting. Craig is an interesting guy. If you have been to Wintergrass or any Pacific Northwest Bluegrass festivals, you may have crossed paths with Craig. Uh, He was in the band Jerusalem Ridge for many years. He ran the Nimble Fingers Music Camp for many years. But a lot of people, myself included, probably first noticed Craig as the happy-go-lucky Canadian guy with a giant smile on his face with three very special instruments around his shoulders running around from jam session to jam session. Craig had, and I think still has, some amazing instruments and The coolest thing about him is you'd go to a bluegrass festival, and he talks about this a little bit and why he did it. Uh, You'd go to a festival. Craig would have pretty much the holy trinity of bluegrass instruments, a 1923 Lloyd Lore signed F5 mandolin, just like Bill Monroe's. He'd have a 37 Martin D28, and then he would have a flathead Gibson pre-war five-string banjo. He'd have these around his shoulder. He'd be lugging them around, and he would let literally anyone play them who asked. He just wanted to share the joy and the bounty of these instruments and uh, and turn people on to vintage instruments. And he is one of the coolest guys I know, one of the funniest guys I know, and uh, just thinking about him brings a smile to my face. And etiquette precluded me from ever asking him, how the heck do you own what's basically a half million dollars worth of instruments. What are you doing? What's your story? So on today's podcast, I got to hear the story, and it is even more fascinating than I would have ever thought. Craig, since pretty much the age of 13 or 14, has just centered his entire life on music and getting great instruments, and he worked his butt off to do it. And it is an amazing story. Uh, As a lot of my favorite interviews have been doing lately, this goes way deeper than just music and uh, geeking out on instruments and serial numbers. Uh, Craig actually cannot play music right now, uh, and he describes what is going on uh, with his body and how he is dealing with it. And uh, it's a pretty amazing conversation. I think you will enjoy it even if you're not into bluegrass. I think you will agree that Craig is one of the great characters of the musical instrument community, and uh, I know a few of you requested that I get him on the podcast. I'm glad I finally did. Before we get to the interview with Craig, I want to give a shout out to a couple of our sponsors, Mono Cases. Go to monocreators.com, see their entire line of gig bags. I, as I've told you before, am rocking the Mono Vertigo case for my parts caster, but everything that they do is top notch and just so beautifully designed. I don't think you can go wrong with anything they're doing. 
Also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Retrofret Vintage Guitars in Brooklyn. Um, Retrofret is one of those stores where it's so curated. Everything they have is amazing. I, I look through their listings and I geek out about every instrument they post about and their descriptions sort of almost like a throwback to what Stan Jay used to do at Mandolin Brothers, are so spot on and educational. They lack a little of Stan's hype, which is probably a good thing. But uh, I learned so much reading about them all the time. They've got a 1946 Epiphone Deluxe Arch Top. It's a natural top. It's got the Frequenstator tailpiece. It looks amazing. They've got a 1962 Fender Jaguar for you electric players out there. And they've got a 1938 Gibson F5. We talk about F5s a lot on this podcast with this with Craig, but... Uh, a little earlier. But uh, anyways, everything they have is amazing. Go to retrofret.com. And if you're ever in the Carroll Gardens neighborhood of New York, you definitely have to go see their showroom and say hello. Speaking of electrics, Fretboard Journal 45 is off to press. Right now we're teeing up the electric annual that we did. Uh, this will be our second one that we do. Probably our last one, to be honest, between us. It's just too much work. Unless uh, thousands of you clamor for it uh, who haven't been. Uh, I think we'll probably call it a day after this one, but the, we're going out with a bang. This is probably one of the best fretboard journal books we've ever produced. It is not included in your subscription because I know a lot of fretboard journal subscribers don't care about electric instruments, but uh, you can add it on by going to fretboardjournal.com and the shop tab. Very limited run. We are uh, literally basing our print run based on uh, the pre-orders we get and what the stores want. So Order that, snag your copy if you want. It's going to mail out right towards the end of the year. And in other electric guitar news, the Fretboard Journal's Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, which I co-host with Skip Simmons, uh, is about to celebrate its year anniversary. And so if you head on over to either the Fretboard Journal's Instagram page or Vintage Amps podcast, that's our Instagram page for the Truth About Vintage Amps, you can enter to win a brand new Stumac champ kit uh and and have a hobby for uh winter you can be putting together your own tube amp the stumac kit is amazing the instructions are super thorough uh in terms of what you need to actually put this thing together you could probably get by with about a hundred dollars on a soldering gun and some solder and maybe a fan to blow the fumes away uh and a light that's kind of all you need and some basic household tools and you will be in business so uh go to the Fretboard Journal pod, uh, Instagram page or the Vintage Amps podcast page. Uh, and if you haven't tuned in to the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, you definitely should because we talk about a lot more than just uh, grid plate resistors and boring stuff. Uh, we're sharing recipes, parenting tips, you name it. Uh, the amps are kind of an excuse to get to talk to Skip every two weeks. Without further ado, I'm going to get to our conversation with Craig. I hope you all enjoy it. The first three to four minutes, there was some internet lag time going on, so bear with me. I wanted to include that part of the interview, even though it's a little garbled, thanks to Skype. Uh, but for whatever mysterious, magical reason, the, the rest of the conversation after the first three or four minutes is crystal clear. So just bear with us. There's a lot of information that Craig shares in that first part, and I just didn't want to omit it. So thanks again. If you like this podcast, as always, share it with friends. Leave us a review on iTunes. And uh, like I said, here is my conversation with Craig Korth of Nelson, British Columbia. So we, we go a, way, a ways back, but... I'm not sure I know your whole story. I know you as the guy that I see at the bluegrass festivals with three very valuable instruments usually around his shoulders. And the coolest thing about you and the thing that I really admire about you is you're letting pretty much anyone who looks interested in playing these, whether they're seven years old or 70 years old, try out your lore. And then what else, what other instruments have I seen you with? Well, uh, so... When I, I think when uh, when you remember me doing that, we used to um, we have a camp called Nimble Fingers. We can talk about that sometime. Yeah, but um, one of the things that really affected me was I met some really wonderful people over the years. And one of them was Tony Rice, and he let me play his 1935 D28, and just a, a whole bunch of really cool people that let me play their beautiful old vintage vintage instruments. And I always – it really affected me deeply. So when we would set up a booth at Wintergrass, I would take a 1923 Gibson Lloyd Lore mandolin that was made on the same day as Bill Monroe's, a 1937 Herringbone D28 and a pre-war Gibson flathead five-string banjo and put them on a stand and a little sign say, do you want to play something? And then I'd even put on um, 
like the banjo hangout and the mandolin cafe and the unofficial Martin Guitar Forum. If you want to come and play any of these instruments, I'll be in a booth outside the main doors at Wintergrass and we'd be there for four days. And it was amazing how many people came by and, you know, some people wouldn't even touch them because they were too scared. Other people would play for hours and uh, some people, one person even cried when they got to hold <laughs> the mandolin. And um, it was wonderful. And I met some incredible people and had some amazing jams too. So I, I just wanted to give back. And, um, you know, some people told me they said they never even thought they'd be in the same room with some of those instruments. So, and I let absolutely anyone play them who wanted to play. Yeah. That is pretty much the holy trinity of bluegrass. So I'm assuming bluegrass has been in your blood for a while. How did you first connect with that music? Well, you know, um, I, I didn't really grow up listening to bluegrass, although it was my my dad was a huge country music fan, and he would buy compilation albums, you know, vinyl albums in the late '60s, early '70s. That there was always some bluegrass in there. And um, in 1974, in October, I remember it. I came home from school in grade six, and my mother just loved the sound of the banjo. She said to me, "We got the banjo." She was flipping through the yellow pages in Edmonton and looking for a vacuum cleaner repair, and stumbled onto the house of banjo. And uh, I didn't even really know what a banjo was. And I said, "Well, okay." So we went down to the house of banjo, and um, uh, the uh, person who was there, Don. He, she said, well, what kind of banjo do you want to play, four-string or five-string? And I said, I don't know. Is there a difference? And he said, sure. So he got the four-string, and he played some Dixieland, and it was really fast, and it was loud and sounded like a machine gun to me. I'm like, no, I don't want to play that, although I love it now. But um, <laughs> then he played Ripple Creek on the five-string banjo, three-finger bluegrass style, and it happened to me. And I'm like, I'll play that. And so I rented a plastic harmony banjo for $10 a month. And um, I took my first lesson and I, came, I fell asleep with it on my stomach. I, I just couldn't put it down. And, uh, you know, I honestly felt like I was a set of Christmas lights that had been plugged in as soon as I started to play it. I just fell in love with banjo. And then when did the guitar and the mandolin come to come into the fore? The guitar, my sister took guitar lessons at the same time, but she was two and a half years older than me and had found boys by then <laughs> and around a lot. And um, I, I, I started trying to play what I was learning on banjo, on guitar. And then um, someone showed me how to play the, the rock and roll shuffle, you know, dum da 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 dum da 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 on the bottom two strings of the guitar. For about six months, I was learning songs only on the bottom two strings, the E and the A, all going all the way up to 16th fret. And um, then somebody said, you know, you can move that down one set of strings. I'm like, what? No way. And... Um, Eventually, somebody gave me Deacon Dan Crary's uh, flat picking book, which might be the very first flat picking book that came out. And um, so I started them both in 1974. Wow. And re really for it. You know, I, I just loved them. And I, I was kind of a socially awkward uh, kid, you know. And so I, I got a lot of solace out of practicing and um, just loved it. I was going to ask, where did you know any bluegrass players in, in Edmonton, or did, did was this just your own personal journey? You know, it was my own personal journey, but my parents were very cool. So in 1976, when I was 14, uh, my parents were like, there's no bluegrass here. Let's take you to Nashville in the summertime. So we got in our truck with our 20-foot travel trailer, and I just got my learner's permit, and we drove to Nashville from Edmonton, Alberta, northern Alberta, and... Um, hung out in Nashville for, I think, three weeks. Holy cow. And, yeah. And so my parents looked, you know, looked for um, jam sessions and everything. And so we'd go to this, like, Goodlettsville, which is just like a suburb of Nashville. And we'd go on Saturday night to a grocery store where they pushed the, the meat freezers out of the way. And you would sit in the aisles and watch these great bluegrass players play. And I went up and played with them. And we went to a whole bunch of jams. And... Um, also, we went to the Grand Old Opry on a Saturday afternoon. They had a matinee, and they had a trailer set up with um, entertainment while you stood in line to go inside, and it was Lester Flat and the Nashville Grass. <laughs> and um, Marty Stewart was playing in the band because he, he was like this little kid. He's not that much older than me. I'm like, whoa, this is cool. I never thought I'd see Lester Flat in my life. And, uh, and then what happened was we went to the Ernest Tubb record shop, and on Saturday night, after the Opry, they had a, 
um, really cool jam session with the Opry stars would come and you'd stand in the record shop and they had a stage at the back. But then we went through and anything that had a banjo on it, a record album, we bought it. And that's how I got exposed to the Stanley brothers and to Jim and Jesse and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was a real eye opener for me. And that's when I really fell in love with bluegrass. And that year, Jim and Jesse came to Edmonton and um, I got to see my first like live bluegrass band um, just before we went to Nashville. It was incredible. And they were just wonderful, you know, great on stage, cool songs. And uh, went to a workshop with Garland Shooping, the banjo player with Jim and Jesse. And um, I w- I've got a picture of me that someone sent me recently, and I look completely confused, <laughs> like completely spellbound. I had no idea what was going on. But yeah, it really, that's when my love of bluegrass really took off. Wow. And and were you into the popular music of the day as well, or was it like all bluegrass oh, yeah. all the time? <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I was I was like a total rocker, too. You know, I would lis- listen to bluegrass at home where nobody can see me. And then um, I, my very first concert that I went to was 1977. I went with my cousin and um, we went to see Kiss. And, you know, I went from Jim and Jesse to <laughs> Kiss. And <laughs> this is like right, right when they just got famous. And Cheap Trick was the opening act. And I went to the Coliseum and Gene Simmons is drooling blood and the, you know, the drums are on this hydraulic thing that goes up with this giant cat on it. I was completely blown away. So, uh, yeah, there was, I was heavily into rock and roll music and, you know, saw first Van Halen album concert tour and ACDC's uh, Back in Black tour, all the while going to any bluegrass that came to uh, Edmonton as well. Wow. And uh, what would you go to school for? Well, you know, I, after I got out of high school, all through high school, I took machine shop. I just fell in love with metalworking, but I wanted to go to um, music school. There was a great school in Evans. It still is. Uh, Grant McEwen, at the time it was Grant McEwen College. It's now a university. And they had a, a, an amazing music program. But my parents, my dad was a welder and a pipe fitter and my mom was a nurse. And they're like, no way. You've got to get uh, a trade. <laughs> and I'm like... So I, I roofed for the summer of 1980, and I realized I did not want to be a roofer. <laughs> I think I ended up getting skin cancer taken off my chin about 10 years ago because how many times I got sunburned on a roof that summer. But um, uh, so I'm like, what am I going to do? And, and I remembered, you know, being in the machine shop and how much I liked it. You know, the precision of it and just making something every day was so cool. So I went and um, applied at the Alberta Research Council and um, – they said, you know, we're not taking any um, apprentices on right now. Do you know anything about even what a machinist does? And I pulled out all the things that I had made in high school because I took a half a day for a year of machine shop. And um, I had all these projects and I took them out and showed them. And they're like, oh, geez, but we didn't know that there was anybody out there that your age that even knew what it was. So they took me on as an apprentice. So I became uh, an apprentice machinist. And it worked with professors in this cool machine shop where they were, you know, doing all these scientific experiments. They, the professors would have ideas, come into the machine shop and say, we need to do this. But can you make something that will help us do that? So, you know, between the, the machinist there and the boss, we would have to draft it all out. Then I would, you know, as an apprentice, make parts of it. Or sometimes as I got farther and farther along, I'd make the whole thing and um, got my ticket as a machinist in 1984 and uh, uh, moved on actually to the Alberta Laser Institute and made prototype medical lasers for a, a couple of years there as well. Wow. It's fantastic. You know, it just, uh, uh, you know, I always whined about how I never got to go to music school. And every day when I, I do something that, you know, I learned as a machinist, I'm so thankful. So I stopped whining about that now. <laughs> so you're working with lasers and then what happened next? Well, you know, I, I was doing the uh, nine to five thing, you know, it actually was like 7.30 to 4.30. And I realized that when you do that, you know, you've got to really like your job because by the time you get home and you have your dinner and then you clean up at seven o'clock and then to be at work at 7.30, you got to get up about, you know, six o'clock. Sure. And I realized that as a musician, I didn't have any time to practice. So I'm like, what can I do to uh, get a job where they'll pay me to practice? And then all of a sudden, one day, I'm sitting at my bench in the machine shop having a uh, coffee break, and I'm reading the paper, and it says, fire department hires for the first time in five years, because there had been this big recession in 1981. 
and this is 1986. And I thought, you know, I went and talked to my dad's best friend who was a captain in the fire department. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, you do your inventory on the trucks in the morning, clean up, have some breakfast. And if you don't get any calls, then the day is your own. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> so I applied. And it was so hard. It was, I think, uh, you know, there's somewhere between maybe around 3,000 people applied for the job because it, you couldn't even buy a job in 1986. It was really depressed in, in Edmonton. And I think probably all of Canada, maybe the States too. But um, I was lucky enough to get one of those jobs. There was only 25 jobs because they trained 25 people at a time. And uh, got on the fire department, went through basic training and got on the floor by December and uh, started a career as a firefighter, full-time city firefighter. Wow. Now in the States, when I picture a firefighter, you have to go through like basically basic training. You're climbing up ropes and ladders. Did you have to go through all of that like physical oh, yeah. stuff? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Basically what it was, was it was a whole, in the morning we showed up at the, uh, uh, at a thing called the Kinsman Field House, which was staffed by uh, people from the education, the physical education department of the university. And they trained our class for a couple of hours doing, you know, swimming and um, these, you know, we do, you'd have to do push ups and then run to the next thing where you jump over benches and then run up and downstairs. And if you were the last person there, you'd have to do 30 push ups. So you're just like running and running, doing this interval training. And we did that in the morning. Then we went back to the fire training school, did um, all of the academic stuff. And then in the afternoon, it was all what you're talking about climbing ropes. You know, we had a Burn, burn building and had uh, smoke houses and, you know, a six story uh, high rise that you had to repel off of and everything. It was great. It was actually that training was four months long. And by the time I got out, I could bend steel with my butt cheeks. <laughs> it, it was uh, it was great. Like and a wonderful experience. You know, I just talked to one of the guys that I came on with today. Like, we're still friends with some of them. It was a, it was a, I, for me, it was a life changing experience, like just amazing. And were you able, once you got that gig to finally like dive into music further and have the hours you needed? Oh yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, I'll tell you though, you know, nothing is for free. Firefighters do a very hard job. Like sure. when you don't work, you get to watch TV and you get to, you know, cook in the thing and, or, you know, cook in the kitchen there and, you know, play practical jokes on each other. But the minute the bell rings, you're on and you don't have any idea what you're going to. You know, there it, you may go to car accidents or, oh man, people getting their arm caught in a meat grinder or like you could just not even imagine what can happen to a human being. And fires are just absolutely terrifying, you know, to go into a burning house that everyone else is running out of and you're running into it. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. And, but, you know, so that put aside, I, I did have a lot of time to practice. And, um, you know, I ended up in 1988 going to Telluride, Colorado, to the very first Telluride Bluegrass Academy, which they only did once. And they had Sam Bush and Jerry Douglas and Edgar Meyer and Bela Fleck teaching for five days. So my grandpa, I couldn't afford to go, but my grandfather paid for my trip there and, uh, well, at least paid for the uh, tuition. And so I, I went to Telluride and spent five days learning from Bela Fleck. It was unbelievable. And the great thing about the fire department was I had so much time to practice all the things that he showed us and, uh, you know, try to integrate all, all all of those things into my playing. And, you know, I was grateful, yeah. grateful for that job. At any point, did you favor one instrument over the other? Or were you always kind of bouncing between all the bluegrass instruments? Well, you know, uh, for a long time, I just played banjo and and drums. In high school, I had my my cousin played bass in a in a dance band that okay. played in rurally in you know for small communities for just weddings and banquets. So their drummer quit, and I was dating a girl in high school who showed me how to play the drums. And I'd only been playing for about six months, and their drummer quit, and they had all these dates. So I became their drummer, <laughs> and so I I drummed in a dance band for a few years, and. I'll tell you, I think that was almost one of the most valuable things musically I ever did. You know, trying to keep a groove going so that people want to dance to it is is a really valuable thing to be able to do. And it, it, it really affected my banjo playing and stuff. But I always um, always played guitar and banjo. And I, I really got into um, 
sort of old swing jazz, you know, during that period in the late 80s and took some lessons with a really great teacher in Edmonton and really dove into, you know, trying to learn that style. And uh, uh, then tr really trying to figure it out on the banjo too. Like how to, I went through uh, the Mickey Baker book for, uh, what is it? The Mickey Baker book for rhythm and hot jazz guitar or something. It was a really great book. Sure. And, um, but I went through it with the banjo, trying to figure out those, uh, you know, chords and stuff. But then I found this book called um, The Praxis Collection. It was the Theory Fingerboard Connection. Just this amazing book. I think it's out of print. And I went through quite a bit of that with the banjo. And so all of a sudden I could start to play, like I could read a jazz chart and play all those minor seven flat five chords and everything on the banjo. And... Um, and, and and on the guitar as well. And so so I was going down like the bluegrass, like really, really hardcore bluegrass um, banjo and guitar, but on the other side, like the swing jazz kind of stuff as well. Yeah. And uh, and how long were you a firefighter? 14 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. And were you having like, were you in bluegrass bands and like really playing a lot when during this whole time? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I really believe in visualization. You know, I didn't even know I always did it. But when I went to Telluride, I, I was jamming every night on the parking lot with people from all over, you know, coming to the Telluride Bluegrass Festival and just getting in these really crazy, heavy, fun jams. And um, when I came back to Edmonton, I'm like, I want to be in a bluegrass band. And even though the city's a million people, there was only one bluegrass band in Edmonton. But there was an ad in the bargain finder that said, um, wanted banjo player for bluegrass band. I'm like, that's me. So I phoned him up and they said, oh, yeah, last week while I was in Telluride, we got a guy. <laughs> and I was just like so crushed. I, I couldn't believe it. And I would go to their, you know, concerts that they would play. They played the Edmonton Folk Festival and that year. Bill Monroe played and Hot Rise played and and um, they were at the after parties with them and I wasn't. But when I go to bed at night, I'd close my eyes and then all of a sudden I could see me playing with that band and uh, on stage. I don't know why, but. Two months later, we get a call. Yeah, Terry Knutson was our banjo player. He got transferred two hours out of Edmonton, and he can't be in the band anymore. Would you like to be our banjo player? I'm like, no way. <laughs> so I got in a bluegrass band. It was called um, Slim Pickens, and it was a good name for the band because that's really what the music was. But um, we it, it morphed into a band the next year called Jerusalem Ridge, and uh, we ended up playing, you know, all over the place. For 18 years, we were together. And um, we were, like, during that time I was a firefighter, we were playing, you know, sometimes 10 festivals in a summer. And, you know, we do 40 dates a year. Everybody worked full time. But they were all wonderful musicians and really nice guys. And, and we just, I had the time of my life. We just played festival after festival and um, met lots of great other players. And that's really what spurred me on to wanting to learn more than just bluegrass, because you'd be at a like a, a folk festival in Canada with all these great bands that played everything but bluegrass. We were usually the only bluegrass band at a folk festival. And then they'd want to play, you know, Lady Be Good. I'm like, well, how does it go? And they couldn't show me. And so that's really what got me wanting to learn more than just bluegrass. We did play a lot of bluegrass festivals as well. But yeah, so I was constantly playing, just playing my face off. And uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, that's it. No, I was just going to say at this point, did you already have the, the vintage gear bug in you or were you just playing off the shelf stuff? Well, you know, the vintage bug with me started um, when I was 14. You know, I, I started playing banjo and um, it, the vintage banjo bug didn't really, really uh, bite me. But uh, we went we went to. Um, grew in guitars in Nashville in 1976, which was a really amazing experience. It was, you know, I'd never seen anything like that. And there were really no stores like that in 1976. Yeah. It was in this really skinny building on Broadway. And um, they, you know, we tr it was my first exposure to anything old and cool. And my mom is like, look at, there's a, there, there's a banjo here. It's a Gibson and it says pre-war flathead. And I didn't even know what that meant. And she's like, we should buy this. And, and it was $2,500 at the time in 1976. Wow. Which is ridiculous amount of money and my mom said well we'll we'll get a loan when we get home and we'll co-sign it for you and you can pay it off and I'm like I was making two dollars and fifty cents an hour as a stock boy for WOCO this Canadian department store and I'm like how am I ever gonna pay for that thing so I didn't buy it oh. but, but 
I was playing a lot of guitar and I had a man Japanese Les Paul copy, which was a decent guitar, but my parents realized I needed a better guitar. And my dad was driving home from work and he was listening to the swap shop on CHQT radio in Edmonton. And somebody said, you know, I have a Fender guitar for sale and it's $250. So my dad wrote on a cigarette package while he's driving uh, the phone number. So we get home and he said, you know, I've heard of Fender guitars. I think they're good. Let's go see this thing. So we go to see it and it's a, it's a pink Paisley Telecaster with a, a tweed basement amp and it was $250. Oh and so we bought it and, you know, I didn't want the amplifier because I'm like, it's a bass amp. Why would I want a basement <laughs> like, with a guitar? So I sold it to my friend for a hundred dollars in school but I kept the, the pink Paisley Telecaster and it turns out it, it was a 1968. So that was my first guitar. And um, what happened was I, I started in high school in 77. So I'd had it for a year already, but I didn't even know how to change the strings. So I took it to Mr. Entertainment in the mall where I lived. And my high school English teacher saw me walking by with a Fender case and he was really into guitars. And this is 1977, you know, it's there's nothing about vintage instruments anywhere. Mm -hmm. but. He, he said to me, what do you got in the case there? And I opened it up and I showed it to him. He goes, wow, this is this is actually a pretty rare guitar. I'm like, how can guitars be rare? He's like, no, this thing is really cool. And so I ended up you know, going over to his house and he had a 1947 D18. Like he was a really early vintage guitar guy. And he gave me this book by Tom Wheeler called The Book of Guitars, I think it was called. Yeah. Tom Wheeler's. And I think it might have been the first book that really described, you know, what different instruments there were, you know, Telecasters, Les Pauls. And my teacher told me that he thought that vintage guitars were way undervalued compared to violin family instruments. And uh, and he said, read this book. And if I were you, I would buy every old guitar I could, every good old guitar. And so that's what I ended up doing in the <laughs> late 70s or all through the 80s. All because of a chance mall encounter. Yes, a mauling. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Can you believe that? So it was because of him, because of Dean McKenzie, who sang at my wedding when I married Julie 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, we stayed friends my whole adult life. Wow. And, yeah. So you, was, you've got the, it sounds like the most awesome parents in the world. They were willing to co-sign a loan to buy you a, a pre-war banjo. But you're still a young kid. How are you starting to accumulate vintage instruments? Okay, so here's what happened. My grandfather, his name was Carl Hansen, a Dane. He, he came to Edmonton in the early 50s. He moved away from Europe and uh, started repairing Volvos. And he, he opened up his own Volvo repair shop in the early 60s. So while I was in high school, the other thing my parents did, which was really cool, was someone gave me a, a, a car book when I was, it was a hot rod book, but it was like a novel size from 1966. It was all about hot rodding cars. And somehow I was, I think I was nine when I got that book and I read it from cover to cover and I just got the old car bug, not so much the hot rotting bug, but I think by the time I was 11, I could almost tell you what any year a car it was just by the grill because I read everything I get my hands on. And when I was 12, I was looking through the uh, Edmonton Journal and I, I always looked on, uh, you know, 1966 and older. There was a 1956 Buick for $30. And I said to my parents, can we go look at this car? It was Saturday morning. We phoned and they said, no, it's not sold. It was like eight o'clock in the morning. So we went and looked at it and it, it ran and everything kind of rusty, but in pretty good shape. So my parents said, all right, if you pay for it out of your allowance, you can have it. So we did. And I took it home and uh, I never got to drive it because I wasn't old enough. But my dad helped me and we did the brakes on it and we painted the motor, you know, painted the valve covers and everything. And I sold it for two hundred and fifty dollars. Then I bought a 1957 Buick Super and uh, redid the interior in like this crushed velvet and uh, Naga hide and rebuilt the motor with my dad helping me and my grandfather. And I sold that for $1,100. And I wasn't even old enough to drive yet. Wow. And then, how did you know how to do upholstery? I didn't. I took it to this um, lady. I had really long blonde hair at the time. She <laughs> said I had angel hair. She was an old Ukrainian lady and they did upholstery and she did it for me. And it was only like $200 or something to have the whole interior. We took the old panels off, gave them to her. And then she made copies of them from the original stuff. And um, yeah, 
it was it was, it was just wild. So I got into flipping cars, but then I got into flipping Volvos because my grandfather helped me rebuild them. You know, on the weekends I would buy a Volvo and it would need some work on it, and he'd show me what to do and help me. He was really great. He was really grumpy, and um, but had a super kind heart. But you know, I was always afraid to go to his shop because, you know, he'd say. Get me that gonculator bypass. And I'd be like, what is that? And he's like, oh, you're so goddamn stupid. And then, and then he'd grab it and then he'd say, oh, okay, come here. I'll show you how to put it on. And um, so by the time I got out of high school, I had flipped 32 cars. And oh so, gosh. And, and I was like, playing drums in a band and, you know, I, and I was delivering flowers on Saturday. And so I had, I actually made more money than my father, who was a welder. So I always had this extra cash. And I used to go in the bargain finder and find instruments. And, um, you know, I'd be, the, I'd be like the first person there. And, you know, like I, would, I found out where in Edmonton they dropped off the first copies of the bargain finder at a shell station on the south side. And it was like 630 in the morning on Thursday morning. And by seven o'clock, I'm phoning people to go to their house. And uh, I ended up getting like incredible instruments, you know, and flipping those until I sort of worked my way up into the stuff I really wanted. I still have the very first amplifier I bought in 1976, which is a Marshall, it's a JMP 50 watt lead head with a bottom that's got eight 10 inch speakers in a single cabinet. <laughs> I just wanted the biggest thing I could possibly get. But um, yeah, so that's what I did. And, and it was because of that Paisley Telecaster, which I sold to my friend Byron, who owns Myers Music in Edmonton, to buy a 37 herringbone about 12 years ago. I had it right up until then. Wow. But um, that's what got me into the whole vintage instrument thing. And you were a player, but you never felt attached to the instruments or the cars when you could finally drive them? It was always just, you could always view it as just a transaction? Well, yeah. I, the cars I never got attracted to. Um, I was just, I was working to get better instruments. But the instruments I did... You know, I did feel, uh, you know, definitely a kinship to the instruments that I got. Like I, I have, I walked into this shop in Edmonton in the eighties and there was this bare wood, um, Les Paul and it was a Les Paul custom and the, all the electronics were in the bag The finish had been sanded off and someone had pried the fingerboard off and then cut the end legs out with a jigsaw. <laughs> and I asked the guy, you know, I kept going in and seeing it hanging in the shop and I said, what's going on with that, that, that guitar? And he said, oh, the customer came in here and wanted us to refinish it and everything. But he, 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 he's given us $40 so far, and he, he's not given us any more money. So he said, um, do you want to buy it? And I said, I'd love to buy it. And he said, well, give us the $40 that's owed on it, and you can have it because it's been there for a year. So I actually had that guitar, and I sent it to Gord Miller, a, a really great Les Paul restorer on Vancouver Island, about – I had it in a case from like 1984 until now. I think about seven years ago, I sent it to him and he restored it. I did an absolutely beautiful job. And my daughter, if you watch a video called October by Ella and Talel, T-A-L-E-L -E on YouTube, they won a Kootenai Music Award where we live here in Nelson for best original song, best root song. That's her playing that guitar in that video. <laughs> Amazing. So I kept a lot of stuff forever, you know. The, but the really good stuff that spoke to me, you know, so it wasn't like I just wanted to flip things. I was and I didn't feel like a collector. I was, I just wanted to play good instruments because I was playing all the time. And I just kept my eye open for the, something that was better than what I had. That's incredible. Yeah. And, yeah. I, I'm yeah, I'm speechless. Uh, what, because people love to hear these stories and, and also cry over them. What were some of, can you remember some of the insane deals you've got? Uh, you mentioned a few, but price wise, what you paid for something. Well, yeah, I can remember almost all of them. Well, I, um, early on, I bought a, uh, um, I bought a, a Les Paul that I just sold to somebody. I bought it for $625 in the original case. And it was a 1953 gold top. Mm -hmm. And um, I bought, uh, I still play it. I, I bought a 1964 Blackface Deluxe Reverb that I paid, uh, I don't know, $75 for or something. I bought it from somebody who played uh, accordion through it. And um, I bought a, I bought a, a 1964 Vibroverb, which is what J Stevie Ray Vaughan played. Has a 15-inch speaker. They were made for steel players. 
And um, in mint condition, there were, I bought it from an accordion player in Edmonton. There's a lot of older accordion players, Ukrainian people who would you know play for dances and stuff, and they bought a lot of Fender stuff. There was always a lot of oil money in Edmonton. So anyway, I bought that for, I think, for $400, and I sold it maybe five or six years later through Mark Stutman in, in uh, Folkway Music for $7,000. <laughs> but yeah, like... Um, Right now, what I have is a really cool amplifier that I got in 1992. Um, it's a Ray Butts Echosonic. I've seen this at your house, yes. Yeah. Well, it turns out it's what Scotty Moore played with Elvis. All of those songs, all those famous songs, like That's All Right Mama, like everything from 1955 to 1968 was recorded through that amp. And I didn't even know what it was. And I met this older guy and, you know, I bought a 1952 Super 400 from him and a uh, uh, a Johnny Smith as well. He, he said, you know, I took a guitar lesson from him. He had this beautiful cutaway Super 400 that he bought brand new. And I said to him, uh, you know, would would you like to uh, sell that guitar ever? And he's like, I could never sell that. I, I bought that thing 1952 brand new. And uh, I said, well, you know, if you ever want to, just give me a call. So he phoned me a year later and he said, I want to buy a big screen TV. <laughs> and so oh, he, he ended up selling me the, me the guitar and I paid what it was worth at the time, you know. And then he's like, I've got this like 1961 or 62, the very first year of the Johnny Smith double pickup guitar with the, you know, came with a case cover and everything in mint condition. I bought that from him too. And, um, you know, so I bought the Ray Butts. I didn't even know what it was. And he brought it over to my house. He paid $700 for it in 1959. And it totally looks homemade, like absolutely looks like a homemade amplifier. And, but it had a tape echo in it. So we, we came over for dinner. We walked over to the mall, got a quarter inch reel to reel tape. This is in the early nineties and some tape cl head cleaner, cleaned the heads, put it on. And then I plugged my L5 CES into it. And I sounded exactly like Scotty Moore. I'm like, Oh my God, this thing sounds incredible. And I said, do you want to sell it? He goes, yeah, I haven't played it in years. And I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he said, well, I paid 700. So give me 350. So I bought it for $350. Oh my God. <laughs> and he, you know what's really cool is that he ended up, um, you know, writing. He he even cut the ad out of the 1959 Guitar Player magazine that he saw the ad for it in, and he was a huge Chet Atkins fan. And in 1954, Chet Atkins had a a hit with Mr. Sandman, and that's how Scotty Moore found out about it because he'd heard this song. He's like, "How are you doing that?" He's like, well, "I got this amp." And uh, he and Carl Perkins drove to Cayroy, Illinois, to get one from. Um, Ray Butts, but they had to wait in line, even though they were famous. And uh, but um, the the thing is, he has all the correspondence that he had back and forth with Ray Butts, the letters they wrote to each other. It's really cool. And so I I bought that. And you know the list is is long and and really really fruitful. The other thing that happened that was really cool was I I got turned on to Archtops through my my English teacher. You know nobody cared about Archtops in the 80s or 90s or like especially in the 70s and 80s. So in the late 80s I really wanted a Super 400 to me. That was like the king of guitars. And I kept trying to find one everywhere everywhere. So finally I I think it was 1990 I flew to the Dallas Vintage Guitar Show from Edmonton and I met Tom Van Hoos, who uh, wrote this great book on Super 400s and you know, real authority on them. And I found a 1961 uh, cutaway, sharp cutaway Super 400 acoustic. And I bought it and, you know, carted it home. It, this neck was too skinny and everything, but I just wanted that guitar because it was a Super 400. I got home and a week later, there was a Super 400 for sale in the bargain finder. So I <laughs> guy like every 15 minutes for like and left message after message on his phone and uh i it, you know i finally uh, he called me back at about five five to five before i got off work at the fire hall and he gave me his address he was two blocks from the fire hall in edmonton so my grandfather went and got twenty five hundred dollars out of the bank and met me there and and the, so the guy i'm playing his guitar and everything and you know, strumming it and i'm like oh yeah this is really nice and everything and i said would you take two thousand dollars for it because you call me every 15 minutes for eight hours you know <laughs> you're gonna pay twenty five hundred dollars aren't you and i said yes I, I am i am and so i bought it and i still have that it's a blonde non-cutaway 48 super 400 and i think they made 12 that year holy cow and, how much yeah. had you paid for one at the dallas guitar show the one you didn't like Oh God, I traded a really beautiful Birdland and paid at least another 
two, two or three thousand US worth. I probably paid four or five thousand dollars for the thing. And um, I traded that for a really wild Gibson banjo that Greg Rich made. And so I was glad, <laughs> I was glad to get rid of it. I hated it. It was awful. It was an awful guitar. Now, one, but, of, uh, one of the things I saw when I got to see your place a few years ago was you're also working, you're building instruments. Were you like with cars starting to tinker with instruments as you were flipping them and all that stuff? Or was this, is that no, kind of a later thing? It's a later thing. You know, I always like dreamed of, of making guitars and I really wanted to make arched off guitars. And, you know, I didn't know anyone who made them. There's really in the early nineties, there was very little out about guitar making and it was hard to, hard to learn how to do. And then uh, I was at my friend Byron's store and he put out the uh, guitar player magazine. It was in 1992 in the fall. And I opened it up. I think it was in the summer, actually. I opened it up and I looked in there and it, in the back in the classified edit, it said, Bob Benedetto, maker of fine archtop instruments. Ask about archtop making course. And I'm like, archtop making course? So I, I actually just got in my car and drove home and phoned him. And he said, yeah, you know, if you want to come and build a guitar with me, it's a thousand dollars. You get to take the guitar home, come for five days. We'll build a guitar, you know, get it to the point where you have to take it home and spray finish, spray the finish on. But um, I'll just show you everything I know. And and I, I, I said, well, how do you do it? And he said, well, send me a check for two hundred dollars and uh, I'll put you on on the list. So I thought this is too good to be true because I knew who he was and um I thought well, this kid, this can't be real. So I went to the bank that day, got a bank deposit for two hundred dollars, and um, FedExed it to him overnight. And he phoned me, and he's like, "Holy smokes, you must really want to do this!" And I said, "I really want to do it." And um, it turns out, like a couple weeks later, I'm trying to figure out a date with him when I'm going to come, and there were two hundred and fifty people on a waiting list to make a guitar with him, wow. and he only took the first seven people who sent their deposit in and cut it off there. And, and were you uh, one of those? I was one of them. Okay. And Bill Commons was one of them too. And uh, there was a few guys that, oh, uh, Ed Schaefer, he made guitars in Texas. Oh, no, he didn't go. He was at another thing I went to. Anyway, yeah. So I went down in 1992 in, in, in October and um, built a guitar with him and, and just learned so much. And it was really great because I was a machinist already. And you know, I, and I'd come from like a father who was a welder and a carpenter and all this kind of stuff. So I felt like, and he was so open and giving like anything that he knew he would share with you. And, um, you know, he, up, at that time, I think he had built 400 guitars on his own, wow. 400 archtop guitars alone. He'd do 30 a year. It was crazy how much they could, could work, you know? So he had, it was, it was a super valuable experience and, um, yeah, we could call him and just ask him anything and he would tell you. And uh, so that that's what started me making instruments. So that was 1992. Wow. Where was his shop at that point? East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, in the basement of his house. Okay. So did you live with him for the week that you were building this guitar? Or? No, no. I had to stay in a motel. Okay. And, and I had to go out for lunch. I had to leave his house and go <laughs> and have lunch. He had lunch with his wife, Cindy, upstairs, and I would go out for lunch and then come back. But then on Friday night, they had the big Italian um, pasta dinner. And uh, he, he showed a bunch of videos of like Bucky Pizzarelli at his house and all these great jazz players, Cal Cres or Carl. Oh, man, I'm trying to think of some Carl of Cress? No, no, he no. wasn't. It was somebody else. Uh, oh, anyway, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was so long ago, but it was wonderful. Just and wonderful. What, did the, what was the guitar like that you made? Well, I, I have it. It's a 17-inch. It's like his Manhattan model. The, the only thing that's different about it than his regular model is the, the, the wood just has light, um, light flame on it. You know, he didn't use his best wood. And I said, do you mind if I pay you extra and we can use like really flamey wood? And he went, ha, ha, ha. And then we just went on and carved the, the uh, <laughs> non-flamey wood that we had. I guess that meant no. But um, yeah. He, he clearly had his boundaries even back then. That's great. Oh, yeah, yeah. He totally did. <laughs> Yeah, he was really funny because he, he had to go into the army, you know, because of the draft or whatever. You know, when you turned 18, you had to go in the army for two years or four years or whatever it is. And uh, I said, what did you learn while you were in the army? And he said, I learned I didn't want to be in the army. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it, yeah, it turned out to be a really great guitar. And, um, uh, you know, just his whole approach to making guitars was, you know, really like it's fearless, absolutely fearless. Like he's 
He's like, oh, yeah, people, when they get the guitar all bound and everything, they take hand scrapers and blocks and sand the sides and carefully scrape everything down. And he goes, not Bob. And he's, he gets out his, um, he's you know, has central machinery belt disc sander, and he takes out a worn, like, he had everything, brand new, um, you know, 200 grit belt, and then a worn 200 grit belt, which is more like a three or 400 grit belt. And so he'd take out, a, for this one operation, he would take out, like, a worn you know, 400 grit belt. And then he would take the, the arch top guitar body and he'd turn on the belt sander with the belt laying flat. And then he would just spin the guitar around and flatten the sides in one go. And you're like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> it just seemed like it, anything could go wrong in any second. And he did that with everything. He, he uh, radius the, the fingerboard. He didn't have any jig. He just held it on the sander and rocked it back and forth, lifted it up and then held a radius gauge on the fingerboard. And it was perfect. Wow. You know, he could do everything by hand because he had done it so much. So you leave this class. How long were you at his house or how long were you working for with him? Five days. Five days. You take the guitar home. Then do yeah. you just go out and buy a whole bunch of luthery tools or what's yeah. next? Well, I built a, I built a shop in my basement. I had an old, um, an old dresser, like a low dresser that I turned into a workbench. And I used the drawers to put tools in. Bought myself a table saw and uh, a nice general 350 made in Canada, a bandsaw, bought myself an Apollo sprayer and some, you know, cabinet scraping tools, a couple of chisels, and I just started going for it. And um, it, and then he told me about the uh, Asia, Association of String Instrument Artisans. So I went to those Asia conferences all through the 90s until 2002. Every two years I would go to one. And guitar makers are incredible, you know, like, I remember hearing stories from violin makers where somebody would ask, you know, old, an older violin maker, hey, how did you do this? And he's like, I'm not telling you. Are you kidding? That's my secret. Guitar makers are the opposite. If somebody comes up with something like a cool idea, they, they're they willing to share it with everybody and they can hardly wait to put on a class. Like a, that's what the, these Asia conferences are about. If you've got a new way to do something that's better than the old way and you want to share it, you can come and put on a workshop for a couple of hours and I was so impressed at just the generosity from people. You know, I learned so much going to those things. Yeah. And uh, I met Tom Rabicki there. Do you know Tom? Of course, yeah. He just uh, had his finger surgery, I think. I know. That's I, I, I read about that on Facebook, the lovely Facebook. Yeah. Uh, so so Tom ended up uh, putting on a, a art shop making class. So I had been to Bob's already, and I'm like, I got to see how this guy does it. And he has a really cool approach that's different than Bob's. So I learned a bunch of stuff from him, became friends with him. And then um, he told me about Healdsburg, you know, where Luthier's Mercantile is from, that Charles Fox and uh, um, Jeff Trogett and, oh, uh, um, the man who wrote the book, a Japanese fellow. Uh, Irvin uh, Samoji? No, not no. Irvin Smoji. Uh, he wrote a book about crack repair in the 80s, a really great guitar repair book. Anyway, he, he put on a seminar about guitar repair. Um, oh, God, I can't remember his name. He was wonderful. So I went to lots of these seminars with um, guitar repair people, guitar makers. And um, any, anybody, anytime anybody was putting on something I thought I could learn, I would go to it and absorb it. And then um, even recently, about five years ago, I went to uh, – <clears throat> Excuse me. I went down to uh, uh, San Luis Obispo and built a F5 mandolin with Roger Simonoff. Oh wow! And that was really cool. Yeah, I it's bet. so cool to, to get to go to somebody's shop and build an instrument with them, and you know share their wisdom. And the coolest thing about Roger Simonoff is, you know, he's the guy who started Frets Magazine. He also, you know, Gibson went through this awful period where they were owned by Norland Enterprises, where they were like 5% of Norland's business. And um, they, they, they really made poor stuff then. And one of the things that he said when he came to Gibson is, you know, there's a, that period where they made F5s that where they had the lump scroll, when it, it wasn't even carved, it was just this circle that was attached to the upper part where the, where the beautiful F5 curl is. Uh -huh. It was just, they call it a Mickey Mouse ear because that's what it looked like. And, uh, what because it took too much time and they couldn't make enough money so they just got rid of that and then you know um, 
on any arched instrument, it comes down from the center and it goes towards the, the sides, like the edge. And then it has something called a recurve, which is scraped in after the top is put on so that the top can move in and out like a speaker. And that's why you have holes in the instrument so that they can move air. And so you scrape that recurve and to tell you flex it enough that it feels just right. And hopefully the instrument is voiced correctly. Gibson had this big ancient carving machine and they wanted to speed it up. And basically what they had a pattern on one end and then they, they you know, it maybe had a six inch cutter that was round and, you know, almost looked like a saw blade. And then just over the pattern, just a smooth six inch wheel would roll over it. So it would roll across the instrument and then roll back. And all the time there's like 10 different stations that have a cutter on them and it would be cutting tops at the same time. So you roll over the original and the other cutters are following that step up and down and cu carving the tops. But Gibson wanted to speed up production. And as it went into where the recurve was, the, the, because they were going so fast, the, the machine would skip up in the air. And so they finally said, okay, let's get rid of that recurve. It's slowing us down. So they're flat in that recurve. So they, they sound horrible. So Roger Simonoff comes along and he is like an amazing historian and a, like an acoustic engineer, just a talented, deep thinker. And he comes to Gibson and he says, you know, what? I can help you make those mandolins again, like the way they used to be made. And so he he was their R&D person and everything. And but he befriended Lloyd Lohr's widow. And um, she was quite a bit younger than him. He was, I think, 42 when he met her and she was 19 and she lived to be quite old and Roger ended up befriending her and he's got Lloyd Lore's Lloyd Lore. And one of the nights when we were there building his mandolin, he put on a Lloyd Lore evening and talked all about the history of Lloyd Lore and the instruments and had the notes that this woman took on his class at, at his acoustic class that he taught after he left Gibson and was teaching at a university. It was, I'd say just to go to Roger Simonoff's house and take, you know, to be able to sit through an evening of him talking about Lloyd Lore was worth the entire trip, you know. It was fantastic. Wow. Now, were you thinking throughout any point here that you were going to become like a, a full-time luthier? Or were you always just a firefighter who was really interested in how these things were made? Well, you know, I always had dreams of becoming a full-time uh, luthier. And I even went so far as to build a shop. And when I I got married in nine, in 2000 and had uh, had a, a little girl with my wife Julie, and we're still married and my daughter's 19 now. Yeah. But what happened was um, I left the fire department because I couldn't um, I couldn't move to Calgary, which is only 200 miles south, and transfer because of the seniority system. So I'd have to be a rookie again. I was almost a lieutenant, and so I thought, well, why don't I just build instruments? So I started building instruments in the backyard in the shop that we made. But then at the time I was a busy musician when I got asked to tour with people and make albums and, and it got to the point with a baby and all that I had to choose. Was I going to play music or was I going to build instruments? I couldn't do both. And I loved playing so much that I actually put all my tools away in 2000 and um, didn't and sold all my big, like it kept all my wood and kept all my hand tools, but sold all my big power tools Got it. and stopped. Stopped building for 13 years. And were you playing with uh, popular bands or was it mostly bluegrass or a mix? Well, I, I, I was playing, I was still playing in Jerusalem Ridge and we, we developed a symphony and bluegrass program. We were the first band in Canada and maybe even the U.S. to do it. And um, it was called Fire on the Mountain. Oh, and that's the other thing. I got asked by CK Way to be, to, they came to the show, and I'm a yacker, as you could probably tell. Oh. And I love to tell stories and tell jokes and all that kind of stuff. And um, the program director from this wonderful radio station, which is Alberta's public radio, it's been on for since the 1920s, they, um, they, the, their bluegrass host was leaving, and they came to me and said, would you like to take over the bluegrass show? And... Um, I said, well, I've never done radio. I don't know anything about it. They said, no problem. We'll we'll train you. So, so I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So they came down to Calgary. They had uh, one station in Calgary, one station in Edmonton, and um, there was no one there on Sunday when the show was on. So the program director came down. He's like, yeah, when you go to talk, you got to press this button, and when you go to play a CD, you got to do this, and then you got to bring this down and do that. And so I did it a couple of times. He's like, I got to zip back up to Edmonton. I'll see you later. <laughs> And so I ended up like, it was this trial by fire where I, I just was like screwing everything up. And finally, after a couple of weeks, I got the hang of it and started did, doing it. So I did it for seven years and I, I had a, a bluegrass radio show and it was really fun. 
I really loved it. And so that was a gig that I had up and even when I was in Nelson here, I did it for a few years, but then it was too hard to do when away from the province that you're actually doing it in. Yeah. So, so you I, were in Calgary and then you, what brought you to Nelson? Well, my daughter, uh, we've got two daughters, Amy and Ella, and they're two years apart. We really felt strongly because both my wife, Julie, is a really great musician and a wonderful songwriter and stuff. And we had our own band for five years together. And um, we wanted to send our kids to a really creative school. And that's the Waldorf School, which um, they had one in Calgary. And it's really creative based learning. They don't learn to uh, even read or write until around grade three. They just want to keep them kids as long as they can. And it's so much art and music and everything is part of it. So we sent them there. But then by the time Calgary was really booming and it was getting hard to get around in, it was just a big city. And we thought, can we find a you know, small town that's got a Waldorf school in it? Maybe we could move. And we found Nelson. And so in 2008, we packed up you know, the car and chucked everything in it. We put so much stuff in our U-Haul that we blew the airbags out in the U-Haul. <laughs> in, in the air ride suspension. And um, moved to Nelson. And we've been here since then. Yeah. And I, I got to ask you, you know, lately you've been posting a ton about the Nimble Fingers uh, bluegrass camp or in music camp. How did that come to be? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, like I, I, I went to the, the second one. It was used to be called the BC Bluegrass Workshop. And um, uh, I, I went to that in this, the, the, the second year they had it. And Tony Trishka was teaching banjo. So I went and took his workshop. And... Um, I ended up being a teacher there off and on for quite a few years, teaching banjo and guitar. And um, they, you know, I really love to jam. And uh, one year they had me for one week and Jay Buckwald, who started the camp with his partner, Ada Chung, they, you know, they, they needed somebody there who could keep a party going. So they, they came to me and they said, would you, would you stay for another week? And I'm like, what do you want me to do? And they're like, well, just jam, you know. And I, and I said, well, what, you know, what, what, what do you call me? And they said, well, what about camp instigator? So they paid me the same as they paid me as an instructor. And for years, I went as the camp instigator as well. It's a great game. So about eight years ago, they were ready to retire and they wanted someone to take it over. So they phoned me and they said, hey, would you and Julie like to take over the camp? And we talked about it for a day. And the next day we phoned back and we said, OK, we're going to do it. So we did it. And uh, it was uh, it was a really interesting transition, you know, to go from being a teacher there to actually running the thing. And and it's 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 a business, you know, it's not run as a nonprofit society or whatever. It was always a business. So Julie and I, you know, we hadn't done anything like that. And, and it was a big learning curve. But Julie's incredibly creative. And I really like the whole idea of putting on like a great party. So we tried to make it you know, add some fun to it. We brought in dancing. We uh, rented the hall across the way. So on Wednesday nights in the middle of the camp, uh, middle of the week, everyone dresses up and go to this really beautifully decorated hall, watch three concerts and then have a call dance, you know, and and a big snack in the middle. It's almost like going back to 1920 and going to a dance. Yeah. And um, so we, we just, just had a lovely time. And I uh, you know, I, I'm a, because of my radio show, I have a big record collection. I have about 2,000 bluegrass records. So I would bring about 500 records in. And at lunchtime, we, we would have – one day we'd have um, a record day where you could come and rifle through my records and write down a, one that you want to play. And we'd have a guest DJ. And it could be, you know, Byron Berline could be your guest DJ that day or whoever's there, you know, that really is into the record thing and play it at lunchtime. And then – Chris Cool, who's a wonderful banjo player, is also a huge uh, music fan. So he and I would actually have a workshop just where we would go through the record collection and just pick out records that meant something to us and talk about the songs and talk about the artists and so much fun. And uh, we also did something called Bluegrass Karaoke where um, you'd get, you know, John Reichman playing mandolin and Mark Schatz playing bass and Kenny Smith playing guitar. And then you could come up at lunchtime because it was in a tent that was in the middle of the lawn and all of the uh, picnic tables in there, you know, and the lunch is provided by Sorrento Center. And you could go up and sing with that band, like probably the greatest band that any of us might ever have the chance to sing with. And so we just, and the, the all the instructors would volunteer to do that. And, um, you know, we just had a wonderful time. And, but I developed something called focal dystonia a couple of years ago. 
And it's this very strange um, neurological thing that has happens. And it happens a lot to banjo players. It happens to classical guitarists, violinists, piano players. But basically what happens is at some point when you're playing, it starts to feel weird that you're like my right hand started to feel weird. And I, I, it almost felt like it was drunk. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. So I practiced even more. Turns out that's the worst thing you can do. And what what happens is your your fingers just automatically curl up towards your palm. And basically your brain says, you know, what you're doing is too hard on me. And um, I don't want you to do it anymore. And it just curls up your hand. And I saw a video of someone holding a violin and they go to put the bow on the violin and their their arm with the bow shoots up in the air and they, they can't even get the bow to touch the violin. Wow. So um, it, it was only happening with banjo two years ago. So I stopped playing banjo and switched to guitar. And then this June, it started happening when I was holding the guitar pick and my fingers were curling up and I couldn't even get the pick to touch the strings. So I had to stop playing guitar too. And partly because of that, and, you know, we'd, we'd done nimble fingers for eight years. And, and I, I think Julie was ready for a change. And I just, you know, it was, it was I, I used to play with everybody who came through the camp. And we had so much fun. And we'd have this all-star band to, on the festival on the weekend and everything. I would play with it every time. I couldn't play anymore. And I think we both just said, I think it's time for us to move on. So we actually, uh, uh, someone, that, we've got two new people who worked f- for us at the camp are, sound technician Peter Minette and uh, our program director who's Kelly Sherwin they've gone together and they are actually going to carry on with the camp oh okay and what's going on with your hand is there any hope or where are you at with it okay so what happened was in February you know I was getting pretty down about it and and I just thought you know I'm not I'm not sure that this is going to be all that much fun because like I am a world-class whiner and sulker when you know, when I need to be, and I'm really good at it. And and that's okay for a day or two, but man, you don't want to be listening to that for very long. And I got a family and I've got a lovely wife and I'm like, I want to keep these people around me. So I started to figure out how am I going to get over this? So I actually realized that p- part of what was happening was I was a perfectionist. And I always thought perfectionism was a good thing, you know, because it made you want to be really good at things. But what I realized from my own perfectionism was I never thought I was good enough. I just never thought I was good enough at anything, you know, whether it was guitar making or playing instruments or doing anything. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And I think I need to get over this first. Because what happened was I kept pushing myself to play better and play better and play better. And even when I had my hand starting to do these weird things, I still kept pushing through that to try to improve. And and, um, you know, I did some, I went to see a therapist and I, I did some work and I realized that it come from, you know, a few things that happen when you're young. You, you know, I had a friend that I had for the first five years of school and one, one day he just stopped talking to me and I didn't know why. And now I realize as an adult, it's because he'd had enough of our relationship and you're allowed to move on when you've had enough of a friendship. But when you're in grade five, you don't know how to you know, say to that person, you know, I think our friendship has run its course. And, but what I had surmised from that, that he didn't want to speak to me anymore, that I was unlovable and that I was unlikable. And um, that started me down this, you know, really negative path. And, you know, I, through therapy and through reading and through everything, I realize now that I don't want to base my life and how I feel about myself on the ideas that an immature 11 year old has. Sure. And so I let go of that. I, with a therapist help, I let go of that. And then I listened to um, Pat Martino. Do you know who Pat Martino of course, is? Yeah. Fantastic guitar player who in 1980, you know, he's a top jazz guitarist through the 60s and 70s, or one of them anyway, you know, playing in jazz clubs when he's 14 in the early 60s. He had a brain aneurysm, and um, to, the operation to fix that aneurysm wiped out his memory. And he forgot how to play guitar. He didn't even know who his parents were. Everything just ended. And it took him 17 years to get back to playing guitar again. And he, there's this wonderful NPR um, uh, interview with him where he talks about it. And he, he said that the guitar used to be an addiction for him. And, and he didn't want addictions in his life. He said he was so addicted to guitar, he couldn't think about anything else. He was always thinking about the future, where his career was going, how he could get 
further ahead. And he was always thinking about the past because he was trying to fix old mistakes and where he'd gone wrong and what he could do. He said he was never present in the future or in the, in the present. And he realized that life really is only in the present. So what he did was um, he ended up letting the guitar not go, but just putting it down for a while. And he said he concentrated on writing and his penmanship and he concentrated on you know, eating properly with a knife and a fork and a spoon, dressing properly and just using all those tools to the best of his ability. Then he found when he picked up the guitar, the guitar just was another tool now. It wasn't this mystic thing that had his whole attention. And and then he said all of a sudden he was able to express himself better and and the guitar just became another tool and then everything really opened up and I thought that you know I was so fascinated by this talk that he gave and when I went to see what happened was a few well maybe five weeks ago I was looking online about focal dystonia and thinking you know how can I get this thing jump started because it's really hard to find anyone who can help turns out there's a, a a doctor in Toronto who came from Spain his name is Joaquin Farias and Dr. Farias was a really great classical pianist and in the early 90s he got focal dystonia and his hands would curl up when he went to play and he couldn't get anyone to help him and he did a lot of research and a lot of trying and everything and he healed himself and so he's been helping people get over focal dystonia for two or since the 20 years he's helped 2,000 people wow. and um, he was putting on a, a focal dystonia hand clinic in Toronto two weeks ago and I just happened to squeak in, you know, at a date because he does, there's, you can get dystonia with walking, you, you can get it in your vocal cords. Um, uh, like it, it happens to way more people than you, than you know. Um, so anyway, I got to go and I, 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 I met with him and there were someone had flown from Taiwan, someone from Scotland, someone from San Francisco, a couple of people from Toronto. There were six of us and lots of explanation about why it's happening. And then also lots of he bring me he asked me to bring a banjo and then he showed me i played for him and he actually just took his hand and he put it on a couple of muscles in my forearm and basically it started to work again and i felt sick to my stomach and then i started to cry it just burst into tears i don't even know why i cried but he said that's absolutely a standard reaction because what's happened is your brain has forgot when you when you go to play and you curl your finger in to play the note you know, that's the flexion. And then when it goes back to play the next note, that's extension. My brain has forgot about extension. And you have to remind it that it can still do that. And focal dystonia is such a weird thing because it's the dystonia is an, an improper movement, but focal means it focuses on one activity. And it only happens to me when I play a guitar or banjo. I, d I can do anything else. Wow. So anyway, I one of the things he said was, I, you know, don't play at all. And it's probably going to take between one and two years to fix. And he thought I was an excellent candidate, especially because I had done all this back work, you know, about the psychological things. Sure. But one of the things that he, he said was, I want you to work on your penmanship. Like, and I realized when I wrote, I really pushed hard with my thumb and everything, but it's exactly where Pat Martino went down the same same thing. So I've been writing every day for, you know, an hour a day and I can actually read my own handwriting now. Wow. It was so bad before. So anyway, it's working and I'm slowly working at it and he, you know, with his help and he, it's been really great. So I, I'm not going to play, I probably won't play for a couple of years, but I actually, with all the things that happened with focal dystonia, I, I, I'm not, I almost feel like it was a gift now like i'm not angry about it or upset or anything you know even one of the other things from pat martino's talk i realized is to live in the here and now if you have anybody that you're upset with or anything and you're holding a grudge that's still drawing you into the past so you need to forgive the people in your life that have wronged you and they might not have even known that they wronged you but if you're holding a grudge that's holding you back so I've released all that. And, you know, since February, when I went through all this, I have not said a negative thing to myself. It's gone. And I'm living a happier life. Wow. That's incredible. 
Yeah. And it's incredible yeah, it's... that the uh, the treatment for something like this isn't surgery or pills nope. or hypnosis. It's just take a hey, break yeah, right. and focus on other stuff. Yeah, and there's lots of really in, in interesting exercises that you never thought would happen. And you know what I found out yesterday is Victor Wooten with Bela Fleck and the yeah, Flectones. Like, yeah, the, God. He has it in both hands. Oh, wow. He has focal dystonia in both hands. Is he still playing, though, or did he have to take a break? He said that when he puts his hand, I just read this online, he was being interviewed. He said when he, he can play the, the, the low E string on the bass and he's fine, moves to the A and his little finger and his ring finger start to curl up. And then when he goes to the next string, his hand, his fingers curl right up tight into his palm. Wow. So I don't think he's able to play from what I wrote. I, I, you know, I just found this out yesterday. So, and he only just, he said he could feel it for a few years happening, but he didn't know what it was. And he was talking to someone at, um, uh, Berkeley, the Berkeley School of Music in Boston, and somebody was overhearing the conversation. He said, "I'm just going to interrupt." Him. And he said, "You have focal dystonia," and he'd never heard of it. So, you know, it, it's. I think it's 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 more common than I thought it would be. Anyway. Wow. Are you still yeah. uh, throughout all this? And right now, are you still buying and selling instruments, or have you kind of put that behind you? You're happy with what you have. I put that behind me. Yeah, I, I, I am very happy with what I have. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm actually I've sold quite a few instruments in the last, you know, couple of years. I had a Lloyd Lord mandolin. I had a couple over the years. I sold that. I sold. I kept it. I still have a few really, really beautiful instruments. And uh, one of them I got from my really good friend, Mark Stutman, a 1925 L5 that I've had at your fretboard journal. So that um, Eli West always asked me to bring for him. Yeah. And um it's a wonderful instrument, and you know I have Ted. I have a guitar that Ted Green owned a 1952 Telecaster, and you know a 1935 D18 that's almost mint. So I I ended up with some really beautiful instruments, and I still have the, some of those instruments. But you know, at one time I had seven pre-war flathead banjos, and three of them were original five strings, <laughs> and. You know, I don't know what I needed with seven bands. That's where have... they all were. They were in Nelson, British Columbia. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I I think um, I think I kind of, uh, you know, that that part of my my life. I mean, it got me where what I wanted, which was some lovely instruments to play, and I'm really grateful to have them. But I don't need a lot of them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't bought a, an instrument in quite a while, and. Um, I don't, I probably won't, you know, I, I moved on. So what happened with guitar making, I'll just quickly tell you yeah. is um, when I moved to Nelson, I wasn't making guitars. I stopped in 2000 when my daughter was born and I concentrated on playing music, but at the Waldorf school, they do this really cool thing. It only goes to grade eight and um, Portland has a high school, a Waldorf high school, which goes from grade nine up. And so does Vancouver, but there's none in Nelson. And so you end up going to public school for the last uh, four years. But in grade eight, they want you to find a mentor and do a year long project that you, you know, you can really learn from. So my daughter tried doing pottery, but couldn't find somebody who had the time to, you know, do it with her and tried a few other things. I still had all this wood and all these tools and it had been 13 years since I made a guitar. So I said, I said to Ellie, you know, I still have a bunch of stuff here. We could make a guitar if you want. She's like, really? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And she said, okay. So I went out and bought a bandsaw, used bandsaw from the high school when they were having an auction and I bought a table saw. And then I had all my, you know, chisels and everything else. And I still had this beautiful like Honduran mahogany and everything that I'd kept for years. So I have all these videos of my daughter re-sawing off the sides. I'd show her what to do, but I wouldn't do it. I'd make her do it and I'd stand beside her while she did it. And um, she, it took a year to make and she did the whole thing. And I got a video on Saturday night of her playing um, uh, a Spanish version. She's at the in Quest University right now in Squamish, you know, an hour north of Vancouver. Yeah. And she's doing a a Spanish version of I Can't Help Falling in Love with You with this, uh, I think the, 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 the lady that she's singing with is from Oregon. And it's, it's um, they're singing in harmony just beautifully and she's playing that guitar. She's, that's her main guitar. It's a triple O, mahogany triple O size guitar that she made the entire thing from scratch. Wow, thanks to you. That's so awesome. Well, that kick-started me making guitars again. So I've been making them since like 2014. That's great. Yeah. 
Craig, I, I got to come back up to Nelson. We got to go hang out. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. It was so nice to have you come here the last time. Well, it's one of my favorite places. You're one of my favorite people. I can't tell you how many people suggested you should be on this podcast, so I'm glad we were able to finally connect. Oh, well, it's such an honor. I listen to your podcast all the time. I love it. And you know when I met you first, was You came to um, the International Bluegrass Music Association convention that they have, the IBMA yeah. convention. That was a long time ago. With your first issue. <laughs> of the Fretboard Journal. That was a long time ago, yes. I remember you at the table, and wow. I still have that issue. <laughs> I have all your issues. You know what? My subscription has left. I realize it. I keep phoning you. It's like, when is my subscription up? You're like, you're fine, Craig. I'm like, <laughs> now I actually let it lapse. I have to I have to re I have to re up. This is the first time since you've started that I haven't had a subscription. It's all right. We'll get you caught up. 